Good morning and good afternoon. I would like to welcome everyone to our session today. My name is Alberto Wareham, President and CEO of Icewater Seafoods. I'll be your host on behalf of the Offshore Fishery Association. We are really pleased to be co-hosting this session with Canada's Ocean Supercluster. Sustainability and innovation have long been core values of our family business. I am the seventh generation of my family in the cow business of Newfoundland. My son Ryan joined our business last year representing the eighth generation. Encouraging him to join the business says more about my optimism and commitment to the future of the fishery than words ever could. I'm really looking forward to this conversation and I'm pleased to see so many and such a diverse group have joined us today. I'm going to get started with a quick video that touches on today's topic. Please note the video was produced before COVID-19, which is why you do not see people wearing masks and social distancing. Almost every coastal nation has um, academics who are focused on sustainable fishing practices. Here in Canada, it's located here at Memorial University. From my experience, the offshore fishing industry is spending a lot more time thinking about reducing bycatch, reducing seabed impacts, reducing carbon. And it's not just about saving money, it's about being a good steward of the ocean. It is very much top of mind now for our offshore fishing enterprises to be fishing in sustainable ways. We're using a grid technology. Uh, it's a uh, filtering system we use in our trawl to uh, remove the big fish so it don't end up into our shrimp bag. In order to compete globally, we need to be committed to a sustainable fishery. Certain customers right now, it's a must. Uh, there's retailers in North America and, the, and in Europe that you, know, you have to have sustainable product. There's a lot of new technology that allows us to collect new data, and therefore that feeds into better decision-making, hopefully allows us to improve, continually improve practices, including sustainable practices, as well as being able to attract a different workforce who is interested in these tools and technologies and different ways to operate in the ocean. The word sustainable, a few years ago, I would never hear it from a, a customer. Now it's always in the front of the quest for a new system or even to fix a system or maintain a system. So Canada's fisheries are some of the most sustainable fisheries in the world, and they will continue to be so, partly because they're well-managed, well-regulated, have good science and good fishing enterprises that have an interest in their long-term stewardship. But what will it look like in 10 and 20 years? I think it will look much like it does now with sustainably managed, uh, eco-friendly, eco-certified fisheries. It's not lost on anyone in the Newfoundland groundfish industry that the global initiative of sustainable fisheries management was born out of the collapse of the northern cod stock in 1992. In Newfoundland and Labrador, we know that moment had a profound impact on our province. What not everyone realizes is that it also had a profound impact on fisheries around the world. As key European buyers and retailers of North Atlantic cod watched the collapse and the aftermath, they started collaborating on sustainability, focusing on doing what they could to prevent it from happening again. From that, the Marine Stewardship Council, or MSC, sustainability certification that we all recognize today was created. Cameron Moffat on today's panel from Young Seafood of the UK can attest to the international impact of the collapse of Northern Cod. But we cannot let the cod moratorium define the future of Newfoundland or Labrador. Well, we need to remember the lessons learned and to ensure fisheries management decisions are based on the best available science, the focus has to be on the opportunities before us. The predicted increase in worldwide demand for seafood presents tremendous opportunities. Opportunity to improve research and better understand the ocean environment. Opportunity to use technology to catch and process fish smarter, faster, and greener. Opportunity to protect our oceans while at the same time safely harvesting some of the highest quality seafood in the world. 
There are people with the skills, commitment, and vision to seize the opportunities before us and to do it in a way that benefits our employees, our businesses, our communities, and our province. It's a very important and timely topic. To get things started, I'll pass it over to Kendra McDonald, CEO of Canada's Ocean Supercluster and moderator for today's panel. Good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you, Al Alberto. So as you just heard, I'm, I'm Kendra McDonald. I'm the CEO of Canada's Ocean Supercluster, and it's truly my pleasure to have the opportunity to moderate uh, today's panel. Uh, today, it, uh, this week is Innovation Week in Newfoundland and Labrador, and it's been a really great week with a number of activities throughout the week. And we're really excited to be, um, be a part of it and to be partnered with the Offshore Fishery Association to be able to bring this event to you and really talk about innovation and sustainability uh, when it comes to the fishery. So for those of you who may not know much about the Ocean Supercluster, we're focused on growing Canada's ocean economy in a way that's never been done before. And so we bring together partners from across ocean sectors who in some cases have not worked together before to develop and commercialize solutions that are globally relevant, uh, addressing ocean challenges. And uh, so we're working really hard to make this the best place to start and build an ocean company. To date, we've approved over $180 million in Ocean Supercluster uh, project value, and we're well over 30 projects in the last six months. It's been busy, and we're looking forward to announcing a number of those uh, projects over the course of the fall, so stay tuned. In the work that we do, we do consistently consider ocean productivity and uh, ocean health, as well as the important role that we believe technology plays in terms of um, being able to achieve both. And so the topic of today's discussion is quite fitting. Ocean sustainability and the future of food are incredibly timely issues and are a part of a bigger discussion around ocean health and productivity. Amongst a lot of recent studies, the high level panel on sustainability tells us that healthier oceans can produce up to six times more protein than today and help feed the world. And I would argue that the role of technology and innovation in realizing this opportunity is essential. Here with us today to explore this topic, a little more are our panel of experts that we are thrilled to welcome to today's event. For our attendees, if you wish to ask a question during the discussion, please use the Q&A button on your screen to enter your question. From there, it will come to me and we will do our best to get through as many questions as possible with the time that we have. With that, I'll introduce our panelists. Once I get through the introductions, we will give each of the panelists a couple of minutes to provide some opening remarks. From EdDNA Tech, we have Dr. Greg Singer joining us. And he is a specialist in bioinformatics, business analytics, and project management. As project manager, Dr. Singer helped establish the ambitious International Barcode of Life project at the Biodiversity Institute of Ontario, University of Guelph, Dr. Singer leads an EdDNA Tech's team of bioinformaticians and data scientists that manage, analyze, and interpret the data produced by its research facility and has led the development of various proprietary bioinformatics pipelines. Next, we have Cameron Moffat, the sustainability manager for Young Seafood, the UK's largest seafood producer, processor. As a key member of the corporate social responsibility team, he is leading Young's work on responsible procurement through their fish for life strategy. He currently represents the business sitting on several key technical advisory committees, including Fisheries Innovation Scotland, the Responsible Fishing Vessel Scheme, and chairing the Project UK Place and Lemon Soul Fishery Improvement Project. With an in-depth understanding of the challenges facing our industry, Cameron graduated from Bangor University with a degree in marine biology. And prior to Young's, he worked within the science and standards team at the Marine Stewardship Council. Then from Ocean's Choice International, we have Carrie Bunnell, VP Sustainability and Engagement. Carrie began his career in 1997 at the Marine Institute at Memorial University, progressing through roles that included a one-year international placement with MI in the Philippines in 1998. In 2000, Carrie moved to Nunavut and progressed through various positions, including acting deputy minister of the government of Nunavut's Department of the Environment. 
Carrie subsequently joined the Canadian Center for Fisheries Innovation and was promoted to the position of Managing Director in 2007. In 2010, Carey was appointed as head of the School of Fisheries at the Marine Institute until February 2018 when Carey joined Ocean's Choice International in his current role. In addition to his institutional responsibilities, Carey also serves on a number of committees, including industry co-chair of the Canadian Seafood Value Chain Roundtable, past president of the International Association of Seafood Professionals, chair of the Fisheries Council of Canada, and is a member of the Board of Directors for Innovate NL. And last but not least, Mark Lane. Mark has called Holyrood, Newfoundland home since 1982 and he holds a Bachelor of Science from Memorial University, an Advanced Aquaculture Diploma from the Fisheries and Marine Institute, and an Applied Business Information Technology Graduate Diploma from the College of the North Atlantic. His work experience includes a 20 plus year military career as a commissioned officer in the Canadian Forces, owner operator of several small businesses and presently employed as the Executive Director of the Newfoundland and Labrador Aquaculture Industry Association, a member-based organization with a mandate to facilitate and promote commercial, commercial development of aquaculture. So that's our panel. Obviously, lots of different uh, skill sets and perspectives that they're bringing to the discussion, which I look forward to moving into now. So let's begin with some initial commentary from each of our panelists in the order you were introduced, which if you don't remember, first up is Greg. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really the oddball on this panel because I'm not associated with the fisheries or aquaculture industries. However, I am from a company that's uh, using a technology that I think would provide better data to these technologies or to these industries. Um, we study something called environmental DNA. Uh, and it's based on the concept that all living things on earth have DNA in their cells. And as part of the normal life process, we actually release that DNA into our environments constantly. So if you or actually to vacuum around inside your house and then send the vacuum bag into us. We could probably get the DNA from yourself, anyone living with you, any pets you have, pollen from plants and trees that live near your house and so on and so forth. And in the marine environment, we do the same thing. We can get a liter of seawater and it actually contains the DNA from thousands of organisms that live in that environment. And we can read that DNA and tell you what's there and if it's changing over time with subsequent sampling. So we established a research center around uh, mid-2017 uh, in St. John's to commercialize this technology, uh, mostly for the oil and gas industry. But uh, recently, we've started partnering with fisheries to expand the technology into this area as well. Uh, this is a major part of the DFO's strategy, uh, using eDNA to uh, improve their data collection and data understanding. Uh, and similarly, the US NOAA recently released a report where eDNA is playing a major role in their new technologies uh, because it's non-destructive, it's faster, provides better information, and samples can be archived and then reanalyzed in the future with better technologies as they develop. And uh, I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Over to Cameron. Thank you, Kendra. Um, so in my section, I'll take a bit of time to focus on the, on the UK market and the importance of sustainability to our customers and consumers um, and kind of how that's affected seafood purchasing, particularly in the UK retail space. So over the last few years, um, we've certainly seen a change in the, in the UK market and the retail consumer um, with sustainability increasing in their awareness. A lot of people going from what we term as um, eco dismissers to eco considerers or eco actives. So this is particularly prevalent in the seafood space where we've seen um, a change in, in mindset due to documentaries such as Blue Planet um, bringing to front of mind issues such as overfishing, uh, marine plastics and uh, climate change. So today in the UK, the, the sort of recognition of third party assurance schemes is, is steadily increasing. So for an example, the, the Marine Stewardship Council, I think it's somewhere around 45% recognition in the UK. I'm sure someone on MSC can correct me on that. Um, but early in, in the early 2000s, it was a completely different space and it was very convoluted it, convoluted in terms of uh, labelling on pack, making it much harder for consumers to make informed decisions. So in 2011, um, a group of retailers and um, their direct process in the UK came together to form the Sustainable Seafood Coalition. Uh, this coalition's vision was to essentially have all seafood in the UK come from sustainable sources. Uh, and it did this through a sort of a risk-based um, decision tree approach where it gave a, a, a labeling guide 
that was consistent with, with two distinct um, options of sustainably sourced or responsibly sourced. And this has been particularly successful in the UK. I think it's been a really good driver of change. And it's uh, you can, there's a good barometer of the fact that it's been replicated in, the, in markets such as Hong Kong and, um, and Spain. So without going into too much detail of the code, these, these terms of responsibly sourced and sustainably sourced are, are really important for, for the UK retail market now. So sustainably sourced is, is something that can be put on pack if you have a third party benchmarks uh, sustainable or eco label on, on pack. And responsibly sourced is more linked to a fishery that could have that certification should it wish, but may not do because it's maybe small, small scale or, or it's also in a improver program such as a fishery improvement pro project or an agriculture improvement project. And this kind of brings me to why, why I was asked to be on here today. We're, we're obviously linked with the um, Northern Cod Fit in Canada, um, with cod being a major component of uh, the UK's top five species. Uh, we really do love our chippies. Um, it's, it's vitally important for us to drive sustainable practices in, um, in ground fish fisheries. Um, and we've done this by being funding members along with our, our major retail partner, Marks and & Spencers, and, and driven this change through the FIP. And it's, it's shown to be hugely innovative um, and in responding to the challenges that face the fishery. So projects that have gone on, including the sort of acoustic tracking work stream, work stream, which is a major investment by the fishery. So this kind of commitment, and the reason I've talked about this is because it allows us to bring that kind of resp responsibility source claim to market where, with a mechanism that can really show and deliver change. And I'll leave it there. Awesome, thank you. And over to Carrie. All right, uh, morning, everyone. Um, a lot to cover in a three to four minute period, so I'll do my best to, uh, to get it in. Maybe start uh, by touching on sort of the required reading uh, leading into uh, today's session, uh, our homework, uh, uh, the article from Nature on the Future of Food from the Sea. I think a couple of points on that. I think one is it's really, really exciting and really encouraging to see such an upbeat story on opportunities in the seafood sector from a respected journal like Nature. Uh, our history uh, on some of these articles has been more around doom and gloom and apocalyptic predictions, such as the dire prediction uh, that all fish stocks would be extinct by 2048, which was later debunked, but uh, people still refer to it. So it, 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 it tends to stick around. One of the key conclusions, I guess a couple of key conclusions from the Nature article, one is the potential for edible protein uh, to increase by I think anywhere from 21 to 40, 21 to 44 million metric tons by, by 2050. Is, is certainly extremely exciting, uh, and, uh, driven by population growth, of course, uh, moving towards uh, 10 billion people by 2050, growing middle-class societies and, and, and uh, particularly in the developing world and the demand that that's gonna create and, and in increasing consumer interest in sourcing high quality, nutritious, sustainable food. And I think this is where we have a significant advantage in the seafood sector. Uh, we, we have high quality seafood, we, it's nutritious, um, and I think if you were to look at an apples to apples comparison of seafood and other food production uh, uh, sectors uh, from a sustainability standpoint, whether you're looking at the carbon footprint, whether you're looking at biodiversity, whether you're looking at requirements for water use, terrestrial land, uh, the opportunities both for wild capture fisheries and aquaculture really are quite significant. So there's some, there are some real opportunities there. I'm gonna make one quote from the Nature article that I think is relevant to today's discussion and, and sort of my key conclusion. So, to achieve this potential that we had, that I just referenced, uh, the potential for increased global production from wild fisheries, I'll speak to wild and certainly Mark can touch on the aquaculture side, hinges on maintaining fish populations near the produ most productive levels. So if we want to achieve these kinds of targets that are being talked about and Kendra talked about in a high level panel, sustainability is a key consideration to achieve that. So maybe to finish my comments, what does that mean for Canada? What does that mean for Newfoundland and Labrador? Cameron touched on sort of the sustainability movement. Uh, in Canada right now, about, I think over 80% over of all of our seafood, I think by value, if I, I remember correctly, is certified to the Marine Stewardship Council standard. Now the global average is about 15%. So that, that's a really, really great success for us here in Newfoundland and Labrador and, 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 in, and in Canada uh, more broadly. Cameron also touched on fishery improvement programs where we're not certified, many of us, certainly in the Offshore Fishery Association, many of our members, are very heavily involved in robust fishery improvement programs to move some of these fisheries that are re-emerging. We could talk about Gulf redfish, we could talk about cod, other species that we're hopeful for over the long term 
putting the science and management structures in place. So I think that's a critical component. Uh, investment in science obviously is going to be critical. We've seen some significant investments in Canada in science uh, in recent years. I would hone in on and focus in on probably the, the most critical component of this from my standpoint is we need more investment in things like fishery stock assessment and stock assessment modeling. That's the, the building blocks and the foundation for sustainable fisheries management. It's not necessarily the most exciting to talk about, uh, but it, it is fundamental, I think. And, and that's why we at Ocean Choice uh, a couple of years ago uh, invested in a chair at Memorial University at, at the Fisheries and Marine Institute. Uh, we commit $100,000 a year to a chair at the Marine Institute in stock assessment. That, la that lab led by Dr. Noel Cadigan has, has grown to about a dozen academics now, postdocs, graduate students uh, that are contributing and working with DFO, working with industry, uh, working with others in, 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 in academia to advance some of these models, which I think is so critically important. So those are foundational things that we need to be looking at on a go forward basis. The last point I'll mention, I guess, before I stop is uh, on, on the technology and innovation side, I think it's critical. And I, you hear me when I do talk publicly, I talk a lot about the fisheries value chain. And I think it's so critical to be looking at technology and innovation investments across the entire value chain in terms of where we fish, how we fish, how we do science, uh, how we harvest a resource, how we process, how we go to market and our, and our, and our strategies there. We need to be looking at and being creative uh, on, on innovation, on technology, um, I could talk at great length on this, but there are many examples out there. Alberto, who, who introduced the session today, has made some significant investments in his cod processing uh, technology uh, in, in Arnold's Cove to be globally competitive. We're making investments, in a new vessel in the Calvert, obviously, that's been well talked about in terms of the eco-friendly investments that are, that are occurring there and some of the other investments across the value chain. We've covered sea cucumber a couple of years ago with, with Natty and some of the investments we're making there in value added technology. So there are some significant opportunities uh, to, to make advancements uh, through technology and innovation. I think the ocean supercluster in particular, Kendra touched on this, uh, has created a great opportunity to engage uh, the local tech sector and, and, and a shout out, and this is my final point uh, before turning it over, a real shout out to the local technology sector in the province. It's been a challenging year uh, economically here in the province, but one of the bright lights I think has been the growth in the technology sector. And, and we as an industry uh, need to be engaging more actively with the local technology sector and the regional technology sector to solve uh, some of the key challenges that we face in the industry and to help move us forward on sustainability, but also on global competitiveness. So maybe I'll stop there. Thanks. Awesome, thanks, Gary. And over to you, Mark. You're on mute though. I got it. Thank you, Kendra, and good morning, everybody. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's discussion. You know, we're here because it's Innovation Week, and I think this week's theme is opportunity in uncertainty. And we certainly live in uncertain times, but one thing for certain, as Carrie had talked about, is seafood, and we have to feed the world. And that, and from my perspective, perspective, that feeding our oceans is an absolute necessity, or farming our oceans is an absolute necessity uh, to feed the global demand for seafood. And that's in, ever increasing because of population, because of consumer trends and consumption. So we certainly have an opportunity here in Newfoundland and Labrador to grow uh, the sustainable and environmentally responsible sector, agriculture. And that's to provide premium seafood for tables here at home and around the world. And as I often say though, bringing, it brings much more to the table than just seafood. It brings jobs and business opportunities in rural coastal communities like Harbor Breton, Hermitage, uh, uh, Triton, Stephenville, Daniels Harbor, just to mention a few. So I know Kendra, you had talked about and Carrie had alluded to some of, you know, what is the global demand and where are we headed? And oftentimes you look at the United Nations and they're using the figure of 2050 as an outlook. And, you know, we're looking at a nine to 10 billion uh, human population by 2050. And according to the UN then that the food demand will surge to 70% beyond today's level. And according to the UN, I always find this astonishing, the amount of food that'll be consumed in the next 50 years will actually exceed all of that, which has been eaten in the rest of human history. And I find that absolutely astonishing every time I, I refer to that. The world's food supply needs to double by 2050. And since 2019, more than 50% of all seafood consumed is now of farmed origin. And so, you know, a lot of times in, in uh, you know, in discussions, people talk about sustainability and environment, and that's important. And as stewards of the sea and as farmers of the ocean, it's critically important. 
I just want to give a, an overview of very quickly sustainability in the environment in terms of salmon farming in particular, for example, to put and to produce eight. 18 billion meals of salmon, so 18 billion meals of salmon last year, we required 0.0008% of the world's oceans. So very minuscule to provide a lot of food for a growing population. And to put it in perspective of other uh, agricultural activities, you got a million kilogram to produce a million kilograms of salmon requires about a, you know 1.6 hectares. To produce the same amount of beef, for example, requires nearly 3,000 times that in land space. And with respect to you know, fresh water usage, food conversion, uh, carbon emissions, aquaculture is the most environmentally friendly form of animal protein farming on planet Earth. So I suggest to everybody who's participating, and I'll, if I can, I can share the link afterwards, there's a TED Talk. And it's, the TED Talk is actually called The Future of Food by Dr. Steve Gaines. And he's the Dean of Environmental Science. And he has calculated the relative carbon footprint of various uh, forms of animal protein farming. And from his perspective, aquaculture outperforms many others. So in Newfoundland and Labrador, you know, we currently commercially farm uh, Atlantic salmon, rainbow trout, blue mussels, and oysters from a commercial perspective. And the total economic activity is roughly around a billion dollars annually, $400 million in GDP, $200 million in wages, and around 3,500 person years of unemployment. And I guess, uh, and the Kinsley report, uh, which was released, I think a couple of years ago, they had actually identified that we could grow the industry here in this province uh, four times of what we currently are today. And this is innovation week, as we know, and aquaculture is one of the most technologically advanced and innovative industries in existence. And as farmers of the sea, we continually invest right through, as Carrie had mentioned to, the value chain, right? So in our perspective, right from egg to plate, and we invest for, in, in terms of innovation and technology in every aspect of that. And I noticed uh, earlier that uh, you know, some friends of mine from Innovacy and Romor, the real-time environmental, uh, real environmental sensors and monitoring capabilities. So I can log into my cell phone and look at a farm and see what type of, um, you know, see all the different oceanographic parameters. We've got Scale AQ and Deep Trekker with remote operated uh, submersible robots, ACFA, Gale Force Group. And these all have a local presence here in Newfoundland. Scredding, you know, in terms of feed, for example, provides innovative and sustainable nutritional solutions. I'll end on this. Uh, look, I consider myself to be honored uh, to be working in such a diverse, innovative, and technologically advanced food production, uh, be it aqu aquaculture. There is an ocean of opportunity awaiting us here in Newfoundland and Labrador. We got the ocean space and the opportunity is ours to pursue. And I think through collaborative relationships and partnerships with our partners in the wild capture fisheries, such as OCI or Alberto, for example, and with you, Kendra, with the ocean supercluster, I think that's key. And embracing technology in the past and certainly moving forward in the future will enable us to really grasp that opportunity, seize it, and provide premium seafood growing right here in our ocean space in Newfoundland and Labrador for tables around the world. So thank you. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. So we're going to jump into questions. So Cameron, here's a question, I think more specifically for you. How closely does young seafood follow resource management, harvesting practices, and technology of suppliers in different countries? Sorry, I take myself off mute. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're constantly following developments that come up. I mean, um, most of what we do now, because of the fact that we follow that kind of um, that framework that was developed through the SSC, we follow that structure through. Um, a large portion of that weighs on on MSC, and I, I've said that, and obviously the agriculture standards as well. Um, and that's it's it's become almost a sort of Oh, I think we lost Cameron. All right, maybe I'll have to come back to that. As, oh, as, there it is. Also, if I cut out, my bandwidth is uh, struggling today. No worries. I think we missed the last little bit of what you said. Oh, sorry. I was going into I was going into Brexit, but it maybe it's best to uh, stay clear of that in terms of continuing development. Awesome. Thank you. So, Greg. Um, let's start with you on this question, but others can jump in. We know that the ocean environment is changing. 
what is it we can do now to better understand the ecosystem and the role of technology in that understanding? And what does that mean in terms of leveraging the opportunity for overall greater productivity in the ocean? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I mean, fundamentally, what we're lacking is data. Um, so we're engaged in a project with the DFO, for example, where they're, they're looking at the Labrador Sea. And the fact of the matter is that, uh, at least in the deep ocean, uh, nobody knows what's down there. Uh, no one's looked and no one knows what's down there. So for the first time ever, they've started uh, deploying various technologies, uh, baited cameras, uh, acoustics, uh, trawling, and uh, they're starting to figure out what, what actually lies down there. Uh, and in addition to that, they've collected water samples uh, to do environmental DNA analysis. And uh, we've just had a paper accepted about this where uh, they showed the environmental DNA actually were, was able to detect more species uh, with about uh, an order of magnitude less ship time than uh, the, all these conventional technologies combined. So they're, they're quite excited about those results. And what it means from understanding the ocean environment is that you could actually do a lot more sampling or more frequent sampling for really the same amount of effort um, as you know, conventional techniques. Uh, and you actually get more data out of it. So I think you know, understanding the entire ecosystem, what's there, how is it changing over time? Uh, we can even construct food webs. So understanding what's eating what, you know, what are fish moving because they're chasing their food and whatnot. Uh, all these things can be much better understood with better data. Uh, and of course, this ties in very closely with sustainability. Uh, you know, it goes back to uh, Carrie's comments about uh, fish stock assessment. Uh, right now, those assessments are based on really poor data. I think even the DFO would admit that <laughs> they have to take a very cautionary approach because they really don't have a good sense on, on fish stock populations. And of course, better data will, will really greatly assist them with those efforts. Thank you. Any anyone else comments on the role of technology in getting a better understanding of the ecosystem? Maybe a brief comment here, uh, Carrie Kendra. Um, certainly, I mean, we've. I'll use one example: the Ocean Aware project that we've just launched with Innova Sea and other partners. Uh, that we had a session on only only a couple of weeks ago. We collect so much data as a company, and others others do as well. And uh, we utilize it to a certain extent, obviously, but it's, it's, uh, it's more backward looking, right? We can look back at the data we've collected, where we fished, how we fished, catch rates, and so on. We haven't really used it as a predictive tool from a forward looking standpoint. And, and that has benefits both from a product, from an, an, uh, an operational efficiency standpoint as a company in terms of bottom line benefit, but it also has sustainability considerations. I mean, one of the things we're looking to do under this Ocean Aware project is a large scale tagging program of the Southern Grand Bank so we can ha have a better understanding of yellowtail flounder distribution, American place distribution as a bycatch species, cod and other species. So we can identify the optimal areas that we want to be targeting our fishing effort. Everything is quota management based now anyway. So it's not, you're, you're not making an argument there that you're, you know, you're chasing few fish, it's, it's sustainably managed. So you can focus your efforts. So you're spending less time, less fuel, uh, more efficient. But then the data that's collected from, from, from that work can also feed into uh, the stock assessment models that I referred to earlier that Dr. Cadigan is developing. And we can start looking at collecting environmental data. Right now we collect temperature. So we have surface temperature and sea bottom temperature. Why couldn't we be collecting dissolved oxygen and salinity and, uh, and, and, and other environmental variables that would be very valuable both for us because you know, we know that fish move based on environmental cues, but also important for our government regulator, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, important for our academic researchers, and can help improve these models, particularly within a climate change regime that we're facing now. We need new, more robust models that can adapt for those sorts of changes. So I think we're just scratching the surface on the opportunities and inter introducing, I know there's another super cluster on AI, but artificial intelligence and weaving that into this conversation, there's so much opportunity. But as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we're just starting to realize what we don't, we know now what we don't know, but there's so much more space uh, here that we can be advancing and utilizing these vessels of opportunities that we have out there. Awesome, so I might jump to the next question. Uh, and I'm gonna follow up. I know Mark and, and Carrie, you both touched on this, this huge additional need for protein. 
And I think, Mark, you talked a little bit about Newfoundland and Labrador and, and the space that we've got. But from your perspective as a province and, and as a country, are we ready to take advantage of the opportunity that this increase in demand uh, is going to bring? And if not, what are some things that we need to be doing to get ready? Well, you know, we, as I said, we've got the ocean space. Uh, we use very little. And put it, let's put it in the context of Norway, for example. So let's take salmon farming specifically. Norway has 25,000 kilometers of coastline. This province has 17,000. Their salmon farming industry has grown to 1.2 million tons. Ours hovers around 20,000 tons. Theirs worth 11 billion. Ours worth or total market value of around quarter of a billion. So that, you know, that's the statistics of it. But we, we have to have uh, a, a we can only go where we can grow from, as a farming perspective, right? I won't speak to, to the wild capture, but we can only go where we can grow. And we need a regulatory framework uh, right from coast to coast to coast. Aquaculture exists in every single province and territory in Canada. We've got enormous uh, growth potential. But I think the number one thing is that we need to be able to provide um, a higher level of confidence for investment to proceed with aquaculture in Canada. Um, you know, in, in terms of Newfoundland and Labrador, as I said, you know, the, the companies are here, they're dedicated, they're devoted to communities, to growing seafood. And I, I think with being more uh, open to, to, to business, we can attract additional people and additional investment for the benefit of everybody. And as I said before, not just to produce premium seafood, uh, sustainably farmed, but but jobs and business opportunities in a struggling economy. Yeah, the one. Any other comments on our readiness as a province, as an, as a and as a country for the opportunity? Maybe two quick points on the wild capture fishery side. I guess one is um, I didn't mention on the front end, but uh, the, the UN Food and Agricultural Organization has a fish price index, uh, and they they you're monitoring global fish prices both for farmed and wild seafood uh, every year. For the past nearly 20 years now, we've been on a steady growth in terms of global prices for the reasons that I outlined on the front end and Mark touched on as well. Uh, the expectation is for the next 10 years now, uh, that demand, now we've obviously COVID has, has had an impact this year, but going forward over the longer term, those prices are going, are going to uh, continue to grow. We hope at least or we expect, they expect based on the points that I'd made. Uh, the, 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 the opportunity for us here in the province or in the country to take advantage of it has got to be based on, on a on, on market cues, and, and we've got to align with those market cues and make investments accordingly. So two examples that I would cite, I touched on the sea cucumber investment that we've, we've been making and others have made in the province in recent years. Um, we invested over a million dollars a couple of years ago uh, in, uh, in drying technology in St. Lawrence around sea cucumber. We did that based on a market opportunity. You're just not going to invest in new technology and innovation without a market driver. We saw an opportunity. We aligned our value chain and, and we pursued it and we're getting value from that and that's creating opportunity in rural Newfoundland. This year is another great example. Let's look at the snow crab industry. Uh, COVID uh, put a massive dent into the food service market, nearly wiped out probably, you know, give or take half, half of our half of the market uh, opportunity this year um, uh, for, for snow crab. Those in the industry had to pivot. We had, we had to move in different directions. We saw opportunities in retail. So some of us, certainly I can use our, our company as an example, uh, invested heavily and focused heavily on retail opportunities. Consumers still wanted to eat snow crab, but they were going to eat it at home. So we you know, we've put a, a fair amount of time and energy in places like Bonavista, in places like St. Lawrence, um, and places like Triton here in the province, focusing on that retail opportunity. That, that, that had a, a positive impact on jobs in our facilities that kept those operations going. It turned into a success story this year overall, but it's based on seeing an opportunity out there and taking advantage of it. So whatever we do has got to be market-based or tremendous opportunities, uh, but our focus now has to be value creation. And, you know, we've got a history of focusing more on volume. We, we, we're moving in the right direction now. I'm seeing it across the industry, I think, looking at value-based opportunities. And we have no choice but to move in that direction. And, and we are moving in that direction. So I, I think we're positioning ourselves reasonably well to take advantage of these opportunities going okay. forward. Thank you. Maybe Cameron, start with you for this question. Can you speak to the certifications for sustainability sourcing that are most in vogue? And is there a quantifiable advantage, advantage to being sustainable based on credits from these certifications? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what in vogue means, but I guess it's the ones that are most widely used. 
Um, we, we tend to go off um, GSSI benchmarking of certified standards just because it, it gives them that credibility against the, the FAO uh, guidelines. Um, it is interesting now the, the sort of certification standards are, are kind of the benchmark and they are of a minimum requirement, but there are still areas of, of seafood sustainability, particularly um, also further into the social element that we don't currently have certification standards for. So when you look at um, welfare and worker voice on, on vessels, we don't currently have a complete standard that everyone is using at the moment. So it's a continually developing space on, on the standard world, but um, it is quite difficult. I think the, the example I'd give is, is in aquaculture, where you see three certification standards doing essentially the same job, um, which annoys me quite a lot. Um, because it's very hard to educate consumers on a, on a single um, eco label that we can we can get behind. Thank you. Any other comments on that? I see nodding heads, Kerry or Mark. Or... Yeah, if I if I may momentarily. So uh, Cameron had alluded to aquaculture, and yes, you know there there are many different certifications, but it's something that we pride ourselves in that we can actually set a benchmark and uh, you know, subscribe to and achieve and overachieve in some instances, things like best aquaculture practices or organic in terms of shellfish here in the province of Newfoundland. In terms of your question, I think it does give you additional market access and it, what it does at the retail level. So Carrie's talking about the pivot into focusing a lot on retail. Uh, and I think you know, when people, consumer trend is today, foodies like myself per se, you know, we're looking at uh, you know, what type, you know, where's the origin of the food, who produced it, where it came from, what sort of standards are in place. So I think what it does, it, it gives you better market access. And certainly from a retail perspective, it gives people consumer confidence of how their food was produced. I would, I would completely agree with, with those points there. I think the next sort of stage within seafood is, is having that distinct link in traceability. So the, the sort of prevalence of the global dialogue on seafood traceability now and how that's coming into its sort of next iteration and, and getting applied into businesses. I think when consumers have that better insight on where their seafood is coming, uh, coming from, that's, that's far more important. I mean, I was asked uh, as part of this as a sort of prelude of what UK customers think of Canadian seafood. And in all honesty, they probably don't know where their seafood comes from. And that's the sad truth of it. Um, but as we move to more digital trace, digital traceability systems, we can really give the consumers that insight into, into their seafood and, and the actual producers behind that seafood. Great. So, uh, Carrie, you touched on, and all of you touched on innovation and the importance of technology. Are there things that you see in other jurisdictions that you'd really like to see us doing here in Canada? Yeah, I've talked a bit about this uh, over the years. I, I think, you know, right now, a lot of what we do uh, here is we adopt technology that's been developed elsewhere. It's been, that's sort of, and because it's what's available and what's advanced. So if we're gonna modernize uh, a processing operation or invest in a new vessel with the latest harvesting technology, it's likely technology that's coming out of Iceland or, or Denmark or, or, or Norway, other parts of Europe uh, in particular. And, and in those jurisdictions, those technologies were, were advanced uh, many, many years ago, in some cases, decades ago, uh, based on needs in those jurisdictions. So I think one of the key opportunities, and I've talked a bit about this, and it's gotta be incremental opportunities. It's tough to compete with, with some of the technologies that are out there right now in, in, in some of these areas. But uh, I think there's an opportunity to really engage more actively with the technology sector in the province, in the region, in the country, uh, to help sort of address our challenges and our issues uh, as a renewable as a renewable industry, both wild capture fisheries and aquaculture, and to develop and hone those skills, those technologies to solve our problems, but then sell them to the world. Uh, so there's a commercialization opportunity. So it, it benefits us and helps us locally and regionally, but then it benefits our, our, our tech companies, our startup companies, uh, our advanced companies to sell these technologies globally, which is, which is how we've adopted some of the technologies that we currently have in place now that we've sourced from elsewhere. So, that, that is really, I think, one of the things that we need to be focusing on. And it's a, it's a win-win scenario uh, um, as, as I've outlined. So uh, I think more energy and more focus in that area. And that's obviously one of the things you're looking at and focusing on through the ocean supercluster, I think is critical. Great, Greg, anything particular you see in the, in the genomics area that we should be trying to bring here? Um, no, not really. I, I don't want to uh, toot our own horn too hard, but uh... 
you know, we actually have what I think is the most advanced facility studying environmental DNA in the world uh, in St. John's, which is quite remarkable. Um, we have the most advanced uh, DNA reading instrument uh, available, which can read uh, something like 42 human genomes in two days, which is, if you remember the first human genome project that took 15 years and $5 billion and thousands of researchers, that's it's really quite amazing. Uh, and we're the only facility applying that technology to environmental problems. Uh, and so I think, you know, we're, we're really in a good position, I think, to maintain our leadership in this area. And we're just looking for more partnerships, more projects to, to demonstrate the technology and, and really grow it. I think you're on mute, Kendra. Pardon myself. Um, <laughs> anything else, Mark or Cameron, in terms of what you're seeing that could be relevant to Canada? Elsewhere? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I've been, um, as part of what you mentioned earlier, but Fisheries Innovation in Scotland, we've, we've definitely been looking at that big data and AI side and, and what that looks like in fisheries. And I think the, what the key point I've been trying to drive in is it's got to be effective, it's got to be affordable, and it's got to be interoperable. Um, Fishermen generally that I've spoken to want a, a system that they don't have to touch and it does everything. Um, it can be just left on board. And I think Kerry's pointed out earlier that the investment in stock assessment is so important. So it's time to now start treating fishing vessels as, as scientific sampling um, operations as well. They, they're out there, they're catching fish. They can, they can bring in the data that can really hone in on those data deficient stocks. Okay, so uh, we talked a little bit about engaging our local tech uh, ecosystem more. One of the questions that we've got is, you know, how can international companies engage with Canadian producers? Can I, can I take the first stab at that, Kendra? You sure can. Uh, call me, uh, www.naya.ca, a little selfish plug. You know, uh, Greg's company reached out to me a several months ago, I think it was pre-pandemic, and toured your facility. And it is a beautiful, state-of-the-art facility. I had no idea it existed in St. John's. And I do see applicability of eDNA technologies in the aquaculture industry. I know in British Columbia, they're starting to look at that. And then here in Newfoundland, there's some great interest. But I think the first thing is, is to reach out to industry associations. Uh, you know, we have our fingers on the pulse in terms of recent developments, and we have the connectivity to the frontline users of the technology. So I think the most important thing for those who may be in attendance internationally is reach out to the Natties or the Tech and L's of the world, the Nias, the Nias, the Noyas. It's hard to keep all those straight. And the Ocean Supercluster, of course, right? We're all partners and uh, we're all in this together. And I think the, the first thing is to reach out. Great. Other comments on that? Gary, I see you coming off mute. Yeah, not, not much to add. I mean, a lot of this is already happening. I mean, we, we, we tend to source both, I think, on, on, the, on the wild capture fisheries and on the aquaculture side, we source a lot of technologies overseas now uh, because it's, it's, the, it's the proven technology, right? So there's no use trying to reinvent the wheel on some of this, but there are great synergies that can be had, I think, between some of these international companies and some of the local, local companies that are either startups or, or, or existing here where there's incremental value, maybe it's taking a technology and adding an AI uh, element uh, onto that and, and encouraging these companies to set up shop here as well to build the capacity uh, in, the, in the local community. I, I think all of this is going to be so critical and it's a big focus of the super cluster, but even more broadly, I think it's gonna be so critical going forward. On the other side of this pandemic, we don't wanna to talk too much about it, but austerity is coming obviously, and it's not a provincial or national limit, it's a global issue. Uh, the, so we're going to have to find ways to do more with less in the years to come. And we're going to have to find the best and brightest and the ingenuity out there in terms of how we do fishery stock assessments, how we manage fisheries, how we conduct our fisheries, and um, utilizing vessels of opportunity that I touched on earlier. All these things are going to be so, so critical in the years to come when we are going to be forced to do more probably with, with less resources. So it's, uh, it's an important conversation. Great. Um, so it, one of the questions is just around, uh, are, are Canadians eating enough fish? Are there, are there barriers to 
Canadian marketplace demand for seafood and are there things that we should be doing to to try to get Canadians to eat more seafood? Anyone want to tackle that one? Do you want me to go? Well, I can't talk about Canada, but it's a similar story in the UK. Um, despite government guidelines on on what eating two portions of seafood a week and being an, an island nation, we still don't eat anywhere near that. I think it's about 1.1, if, if, if that. Um, I think there's, there's an increasing role to play in the marketplace and delivering offerings that, that compete with the other proteins, particularly as, as Mark's a, a sort of elaborated to that we are delivering a very sustainable protein from a, from a carbon perspective and land use perspective, well, all around a holistic sustainability perspective, really. Um, but there's also an education piece that I feel that we're looking at in the UK of, of introducing younger people to seafood. They seem to be afraid of it if it's not in a, a fish finger format, which my my employers probably won't want me to say, but yeah. So so I'll I'll just add a point or two on this. It's a question I get quite quite frequently. You know, why don't you sell more seafood uh, here in the province or or, or in the country? Uh, there's a couple of challenges associated with that, but I also think there's an opportunity. Uh, one is per capita consumption, Kendra, as you indicated, is, is very low in Canada. It's, it's low here, here in Newfoundland and Labrador as well in comparison to large parts of Europe where you've got a half a billion people uh, that, that uh, you know, eat a fair amount of seafood. And if you go to Asia uh, with these growing middle class societies, uh, growing population base, uh, a, a, the ability to pay for um, um, high quality seafood and an insatiable appetite for seafood per, per capita seafood consumption is, is through the roof. Obviously that, that's where your, your bang for your buck is and your, and your energy is going to go because if you have to sell 70 million pounds of seafood a year, you have to focus on those market opportunities. But I do, I do believe uh, there's, there are opportunities uh, to uh, increase uh, interest in, in uh, seafood here in the province. Uh, and, and across the country, both for health reasons, uh, but also for us, I think it's important from a provenance standpoint, we should be telling our sustainability story better here in the province, here in the country. We've got a good story to tell, I think, which you know, Mark and I and, and, and uh, have certainly touched on today on, on, on our respective sectors, um, and we should be telling that story better. So uh, the Fisheries Council of Canada, which, which I'm part of, uh, and, and the Canadian Aquaculture Industry Association, which Mark is a part of, has been having a fair amount of dialogue on that and, and looking at advancing some initiatives in the coming months to increase awareness uh, of, uh, of the nutritional value and the health benefits uh, of sustainable seafood and encourage more consumption of Canadian, Canadian seafood. So I think there's more to come on that. I think it's, it is an opportunity uh, that we should be pursuing more. Great. Um, so, so we're talking about technology and innovation. Are there things uh, with technology that uh, in terms of seafood quality in the wild fish, I wanna make sure I read this question properly. Seafood quality in the wild fishery, especially with small and mid-sized fleets, how could technology potentially improve the overall quality of fish delivered for processing? I wanna tackle that. Uh, well, listen. There, there's always uh, room for improvement uh, in, in those in those areas. Uh, I, I've seen, if you think of, um, and not something we're actively engaged in directly with the, the intro sector, but I know the intro sector. My family are intro fishermen, and a lot of my friends are, are are as well. There's a there's been a significant effort through the Atlantic Fisheries Fund, as an example, of the last couple of years to focus more on the development of longline technology in 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 the cod fishery, as an example, but not exclusively to that. I know there's been a lot of interest in expanding uh, investments in onboard handling technology. So using, you know, slurry ice and, and, and ice technology to, uh, from a quality standpoint, uh, you know, what, what Alberto produces in, in Arnold's Cove or what we produce in Fortune, uh, it's, it's, it starts in the ocean and, and, and it works back from there. So, you know, you have to have a high quality throughout the value chain and everybody has got a role to play in that. We've got a role to play that in that certainly in, in, our, in our operations. Uh, but so does the so does the interest uh, sector and independent fishermen, and, and I'm I'm seeing a lot of focus and energy in that area right now, which I think is a positive thing, and uh, no doubt will continue to grow. I I think we're trending in the right direction, on on all of these fronts, and uh, obviously there's more work to be done, and more advancements to be made, and and I see fishermen now investing in, you know, um, uh, you know, 
uh, apps uh, uh, that they use and, and environmental uh, data collection that they're part of through, uh, through some of the tech companies that are out there. Uh, I mean, there's so much potential, not just in large vessels, but also in the inshore small boat fleet as well uh, to integrate technology into their operations. So um, I think there's opportunity there. Andrew, you're on mute. Okay, I'm hitting the button, but I'm, I'm getting to, I'm getting ahead of myself. I thought it, anyway, it's all good, no matter how many times I do this. So one question for all of you to be able to uh, wrap it up. So you got sort of 30 seconds rapid fire. What makes you, mo when you look to the future uh, in terms of the future of food, what gets you most excited? I'll, I'll take the one first. I, I, I've kind of alluded it to it so far. I mean, the digitization of the seafood industry is the bit that really excites me. Um, going into a shop, scanning a QR code and being able to see exactly which boat in the world captured that fish. If it can go back to the point of you've got marine traffic style, you can see it on a map. That, that for me, is really exciting within the seafood world. So, yeah, the digitization, I'm going to stick with that as my final answer. I would just say I'm most, you know, there's many things I could cover here, but the global demand, I, I think we're in a wonderful position when it comes to, uh, you know, if we're in the business of wild capture fisheries and sustainable aquaculture, if we're doing it right, if we're making the right decisions, if we're doing it sustainably, we've, we, you've seen the statistics and the reports, we, we know where the demand is going uh, for, for high quality food, we know uh, population growth and, and what's occurring there and what we need to be doing. So, I mean, it's a tremendous opportunity. We just have to align our value chain to take advantage of it. And, and I'm confident we will, uh, we've got no choice. Uh, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm very upbeat for the future of, uh, of both. And I'll leave Mark to talk to aquaculture, but both sectors uh, in the province and in the region. That's a good segue, Kerry, and I agree with you. It's the global demand, the opportunity. We have an ocean of opportunity. We're perfectly positioned here in Newfoundland and Labrador to embrace it. And as I often say, we have the opportunity to produce the premium seafood that's in high demand, is labeled as Canadian, farmed in the, uh, you know, the cold, pristine waters of the North Atlantic. There's a demand for it. And in doing so, we can revitalize communities that we've done. We've done it in Hermitage. We've done it in Harbor Breton. And we want to do it elsewhere in other communities throughout our province. And as I said, the opportunity is ours. We just need the regulatory framework to be able to grow sustainably uh, to provide seafood to a growing population. Awesome. Last word over to you, Greg, what gets you excited? <laughs> well, for me, I mean, the, the core thing about sustainability is understanding what's there right now and, and how it's changing over time. And uh, we, we can't answer those questions very well right now, but uh, I do envision a future. I have a colleague that really likes the Google car. Uh, just drives around the streets with, with cameras on its roof, taking pictures of everything. And we sort of envision, you know, what if every vessel was sampling seawater for us? Uh, and sending it to our lab to analyze, we would actually have, in a sense, a map of every organism that's living in the ocean, you know, around Newfoundland or even in a greater area. And that could be monitored over time, uh, you know, as more and more vessels are traveling over the same regions, uh, really greatly enhancing our understanding of, of the migration of animals and, and what's there and, and how uh, things like climate change are impacting them. Awesome. Well, thank you all. I am off mute. Yep. <laughs> thank you all for the for the great discussion. I'm clearly not used to coming on and off mute quite so much. And uh, I will hand it over to Alberta. I'm sure we could continue. Uh, this has been really interesting, but I'll hand it back to Alberta to close us off. Thank you to Kendra and today's panelists. Uh, I thought it was a very engaging discussion. At the start of today's session, I commented on us having people with the skills and commitment needed to seize the opportunities before us. You've certainly shown some of that here today, and I know there are many others out there who share those attributes. There is a passion and a vision to continue to grow the fishery and to grow our understanding and technology as it relates to the ocean. The opportunities are endless, and I look forward to seeing what we can accomplish together. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. I hope you share our optimism and commitment. Have a great weekend. Bye.